Well, it's good to see you all today. It's good to see you too. Yeah, that's great. That's nice. Good to be seen. Isn't it? Yeah. Thinking about getting one of those things that I can just drop it here and stick it back on. You know, I'm still getting used to eyes that see. See the back pretty well now, and see you all. Let's pray, and then we're going to open God's Word to Hebrews chapter 13. Oh, pardon me, 11. Scary. <laughs> 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 Maybe we better pray. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love for us. We just look to you for. Um, your guidance this morning and opening your word. Thank you for the practical truths that we can find here. We pray that we be an encouragement to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been talking about Hebrews 11, and we normally call it the great faith chapter, but I'm hoping that we can uh, make a little bit of a shift, and I'll, I'll share more about that with you as we go along. In fact, I've already talked about it. Notice it says working faith. And it probably goes Good. Remember, this connects to chapter 10 and chapter 12. This doesn't stand alone. We've often uh, picked this chapter out and, and we've kind of made it stand by itself, but it doesn't. The context is what the writer says, you have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what's promised. The spiritual muscle is what we're talking about, the endurance, the uh, ability to last. It's the long haul. It's the marathon. It's not the sprint. Flying in fog near mountains is a very dangerous thing, isn't it? I mean, any driving, any traveling, but flying in the fog in the mountains is dangerous. And one of the reasons it's dangerous is that we lack the visual reference of life situations. That's what it's like in life. Uh, we hit times when we cannot see what's in front of us. And we get flustered, we get disoriented spiritually sometimes, emotionally sometimes. And it is because we lack the visual reference. What does it say? We, we need to walk by faith, not by what? Sight. Sight. But we are more comfortable walking by sight. And that's a challenge, isn't it? We need to have faith in what's true and reliable. Just as pilots, uh, be, are they're very sure of their altimeter. It says how high I am, and I know the height of the mountains. And if I'm higher than the mountains, I should be good. They also have uh, ground radar and all sorts of other things to keep us safe as we fly. But you know that's a challenging situation. And we get ourselves in those situations, though, but faith in what's true and reliable. And what is that? It is God. We can be grateful that God is there. He knows what he's doing. I've been reading a tremendous book, uh, and I'll say more about that another time. Uh, but it, it's good that God has the plan. Nothing takes him by surprise. Uh, he knows exactly what's going on. We can say that he is true. He is reliable. And we also see it in the scripture. The Bible's power rests upon the fact that it's reliable, it is the reliable, errorless, infallible Word of God. We often read for information and knowledge. And I wish, and I, I'll say this honestly too, I wish someone had told me when I was a teenager, you need to read the Bible for the relationship, not just for the information. Wow. I, I wish I had known that a long time ago. That my information on the Bible, my Bible knowledge, you know, we can create fat heads, you know, and, and be proud of what we know. That does not amount to a hill of beans when it comes to our spiritual growth. What does amount to spiritual growth is our relationship to the Lord and how the Word of God is changing us, not just what we know. Uh, that's <laughs> thrown in there just for <laughs> our mutual benefit there, okay? Uh, that's a whole other sermon, but boy, let's capitalize on the relationship with God. I, I heard of a book re recently, um, it's called Nine Lies Christian Believe. Guess what's on the first chapter? 
It's this. God will not give you more than you can handle. Yeah? Is that a lie? Yeah, it sounds like it. Especially if you read 2 Corinthians. Because it says, Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about the troubles we experienced. We were under great pressure beyond our ability, what? To endure. We were stretched. We despaired of life. But this happened. He understood the purpose. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, which you are prone to do, but on God who raises the dead. If God's got the power to raise the dead, can he not take care of us? Absolutely. But we have to exercise that faith that endures, that faith that obeys. And that's where the rub comes in. That's the hard part, is it? Yeah. You know, Paul, this wasn't just a snap of the fingers. If he says, this pressed upon us, and you read the book of 2 Corinthians there, and you see all of that. You're saying, Paul, let's get to, let's get to Hebrews. Well, we're getting there. <laughs> what did we learn last week? We learned that faith that pleases God, that we make decisions based on God's commands and principles, not our own devices. And that sounds odd, doesn't it, sometimes? But we do that. We have to make command our decisions based on God's commands. We don't depend on results, gratification, and success. Those are the things we gravitate toward, though. We are just magnets to those things. That's what we want. But God says, you've got to ignore that stuff. You've got to do what's right, even though you don't get the success, even though you don't get the gratification. Another little aside, when we were in Ukraine, we were talking about success, and we were asking the, the small group, what's your definition of success? And they gave various ones, and then they asked me, what's yours? I said, well, I'm on, I think I'm on 180 degrees opposite for right now. And the reason is, I'm thinking back to the prophets in the Old Testament. Were those guys successful? No. Uh, who? Uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, a lot of those guys in the Old Testament that we don't tend to read, they were not successful. I said success is being faithful to what God tells you to do, whether or not you see any results. And they just went, Oop. <laughs> Okay, that's a little different. <laughs> that's what success is. Okay, that's the aside. We don't depend on our own abilities and resources. But you know, as we read the Scripture... It says in, we're going to be in verse 23 of chapter 11 of Hebrews. By faith, when Moses was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. They were not afraid of the king's edict. This stuff is not easy. When we go on, it may bring us into conflict with our government. Now, what are we talking about here? Moses' parents didn't do what Pharaoh had ordered. He had ordered that all the Hebrew baby boys be killed. And they said, no, we're not doing that. You know, and that is happening today in so many ways. Um, but the idea of faith that obeys, it pleases God, it will bring us into contact or conflict with government and our choice becomes necessary. Where do I stand? You know, the Hebrew midwives um, defied, first of all, Pharaoh's order, and uh, they had some uh, interesting excuses, and the Hebrew women were strong, and they could give birth on their own. They really didn't need our help, so we're not going to be involved in throwing the kids in the river. Chapter 1 of Exodus. Moses' parents said, we're not doing that either, and they hid him for three months, and then they, uh, Moses' mom put him out in the river, uh, and he was discovered. Uh, and no doubt by uh, God's providence as well as some uh, study of what Pharaoh's daughter was doing by way of her bathing. Um, but notice what it says. Here was a crucial choice. And this is happening in the world today. Uh, China has had for many years, and I think they just changed it because of some real problems, but starting back in 1979, uh, they had a one-child rule, and there were forced abortions and um, uh, infanticide. Uh, many times, uh, parents would have to send their second child to uh, live with relatives in a rural area because of this uh, drastic rule. Well, it's done a bad thing in China because now there are more men than women uh, by a large proportion, and there are no wives for these men, plus an aging population and, you know, what the problem is. 
So, I mean, they shot themselves in the foot a long time ago with this. And while they reversed it, there's no way of catching up. And it has caused a lot of societal instability. Um, another one today, um, our biblical marriage understanding um, today is uh, one man, one woman, uh, covenant marriage for life. And yet there are people that are being stepped on uh, in our country. Uh, just recently, there was a woman by the name of Miss Smith. Uh, she felt her calling is to help promote marriage as a lifelong union through websites that she creates for engaged couples. However, uh, because she lives in Colorado, uh, you know that the Masterpiece Cake uh, group, uh, Baker, you know, had the stand of I'm not making cakes uh, to celebrate same-sex marriages. Well, uh, this woman got um, and challenged by, um, or brought a legal challenge to the second part of the law as she posted it. She was fearful of prosecution, that the law violated her spirit, uh, freedom of speech and religion and her right to equal protection. Um, the judge uh, basically uh, ruled against her and compare, pro, compare, uh, compared her proposed website to a statement of whites only sign familiar in the days of racial segregation. The judge said, you are free to express your sentiments concerning marriage on a personal website, but not your business. And also, this is, this is not something that is just far-fetched, that we will be in conflict with our government or business rules in various states or in our country at this point, uh, if we are having a faith that is honoring God. So this is going on right now. Um, when you stop and think about H.R. 5 that just got passed uh, by the House and our uh, federal government, you know, they call it the Equality Act. It is not. It is, um, it is going to be supporting immoral behavior and we are bullied to conform. Um, and that's going to certainly be a challenge. Um, and you could just look around the world to see what's going on. I was thinking also of uh, John Bunyan, uh, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress. He was born in 1628, and a, a very interesting man. And um, after he got saved, he began to preach. And um, he left the Church of England, and he began to preach in the field. He became a field preacher. He said he would, uh, the article said that he was so effective in his preaching, people would arrive at dawn to hear him preach at noon. <laughs> Daniel and I don't hold a candle to that guy. <laughs> I didn't see anybody up at dawn knocking on the door to get in here. <laughs> oh boy, won't he be a neat guy to meet in heaven? <laughs> I think so. He was put in prison because open air preaching like that was illegal. The uh, politicians uh, feared revolution. Uh, while he was in prison, he made long shoelaces, uh, which he sold, uh, and to support his family. He could have he could have been out in three months, uh, but uh, it was offered a condition that he would no longer preach. And he said, "No, nope, nothing to do with it. If I get out, I'll preach tomorrow." He could have had a pardon because Charles II was uh, offering pardons, but to do so, he would have had to admit that he'd done something wrong. And he wasn't doing that either. For 12 years, he was in prison for being a preacher, unlicensed, and desiring to preach in the field instead of a church and the Church of England. So, uh, you know, there's, there's these uh, situations, uh, not only in history, that we read in the, in the book of Hebrews, but also in uh, modern history as well. When you think of what was going on in Moses' life in chapter 11, let's look at verses 24 and following there. When Moses had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches or esteem than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward of Acts chapter 7 and verse 25 tells us that um, he was a man who was trained in the wisdom of power of Egypt. It was very possible that he could have been the next pharaoh because the pharaohs went through the line of the mom. 
And in, in chapter 7 of the book of Acts, which is Stephen's sermon, we have some information that we don't have in the Old Testament. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. I'm just turning there. But as the, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he would have had a fairly cushy life. Would he not? I mean, he was in the palace. He was wealthy. He was well-educated. The book of Acts tells us he, he learned uh, languages and he, he, he was a powerful man. But at some point, he said, I'd rather esteem or value the people of God. The time that he spent with his mother as a little child must have really impacted him. And I don't know what contact they had beyond that, but he said, I am going to be a Jewish person. I am not anti-Semitic as an adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. I am a Jew. And I'm going to identify with those people. It says he made a choice to suffer affliction with the people of God, identifying with them than the passing pleasures of sin. I remember hearing somebody talk about the pleasures of sin. We think sin is hideous. Or is it? Hands? Hands. That's right. That's what I'm looking for. Really terrible. <laughs> and yet this says what sin is really all about. Satan hangs the pleasure out there, but not the price tag. It is always going to lead to destruction. Always. It never leads uh, anywhere good. But the pleasure is hung out there. And Moses recognized that. He said, I'd rather suffer affliction than to enjoy what I have as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, I'd rather be ill-treated and suffer abuse for Christ because this is more valuable. And the passing pleasure, it is temporal, not permanent, isn't it? Uh, the eternal value of obeying God is so important. We get to look at uh, verse uh, 25 here. You know, he, he had to leave Egypt. It says, by faith he left Egypt, in verse 27 of Hebrews 11, not fearing the wrath of the king, he endured, seeing him who was unseen. You know, at some point, Moses must have thought, I am the deliverer. Because in verse 25 of chapter 7, he says, he supposed his brethren understood that God was granting him them deliverance through him, but they didn't understand following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together. He tried to reconcile them together in peace. And the men, he said, brethren, men, why do you injure each other? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you not mean, do you not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptians yesterday? The Egyptian yesterday, do you? Moses thought that he could be the deliverer. At around 40 years old, this took place right around age 40, and Moses thought, I'm the deliverer, I can do this, I'm identifying with the people of God, I can get them out of here, and he couldn't. And he left Egypt, and he went away for <clears throat> uh, 40 years in the desert, I can't preach out of Exodus today, but that was what was happening, but Moses made a crucial choice. He says, I'm identifying with the people of Israel, not the people of Egypt. And I'm going to do what I can. He identified with Israel. It's not popular today even, is it, to identify with the nation of Israel. There are even uh, Christians, uh, I use that word loosely, <clears throat> uh, who are divesting themselves of any involvement with Israel and are really anti-Semitic. It is very sad, and I think there's going to be a price to pay on that one. But you know, I'm, I'm going to, again, depart just a little bit because of this identification with the people of God. And um, it's important that we also identify with Jesus in the way that he asks us to do it. I'm thinking about baptism. As I was thinking about Moses' identification with Israel um, and the people of Israel and everything that they were going through, I was thinking about, what about us today? You know, we have an opportunity to identify with the people of God, identify even more so with Jesus through the means of baptism. It does not save you. It is not a requirement for getting into heaven. But when Jesus said, go into the world, make disciples, what was the first thing he said? Baptizing. Identifying with him. 
Because it pictures our death, burial, and resurrection as we go under the water, it identifies us with Jesus and with the people of God. Historically, it is something that was done in the book of Acts and in the early church all the way along. That was the line of the sand. When you were baptized, you were identifying with Christ and the Christians. Many of you have trusted Christ as your Savior, but um, you haven't been baptized. Now, I'm, I can't pick you out. I don't know you're not wearing a little I'm not baptized <coughs> sign on your head. But I would encourage you to pray about it. Would you do that? You know, they, we live in perilous times. Baptism is not going to do anything for you unless, unless you say in your heart of hearts, I put my stake in Christ's kingdom. You know, I identify with him. And I want to make that public. That was what that was. That's what that was all about. And I would just encourage you to do that. Don't live for what the world promises you today. Live for what God promises you in the future. It's a very important step. So let's go on because there's another principle. Not only will faith that is working uh, and endures bring us into conflict with the government and with business, it obeys even when the directions are odd. As we read on in the book of Hebrews 11, it talks about some events. And in verse 29, it talks about going through the Red Sea. And in verse 30, it talks about, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. Now, that was the odd part of the directions. I really enjoyed uh, Joshua chapter 1, I mean, chapter 5 and chapter 6. That's a terrible chapter division because of... Um, the Lord, the captain of the Lord's army comes, and that's actually Jesus incarnate at that part. Jesus, before he was uh, made a man, uh, in talking to Joshua, and he gives him the battle plan for Israel's army. This is an impenetrable city, and they fight the battle, and there's no Israeli casualties. You know, that's because they obeyed. And the impenetrable city was, it was a double-walled city, um, it was about nine acres in circum or, uh, not circumference, but area, approximately. The walls were um, high and thick, and because it was double-walled, it was all that much more of a problem to be able to get into. And that obviously was a problem. Um, excavations have been done and really confirmed the uh, impenetrability as well as the walls falling outward and it was an amazing situation but what I like about it is that uh, God says to or Jesus says to uh, Joshua I want you to march around the city you and all the men of war and you do this for six days you go around once and you don't say a word You'd be absolutely silent. Could you imagine what was going on in the city? <laughs> I wonder if there are people standing on the wall saying, what are those idiots doing? You know, they march around, they blow the trunk, or they, they're absolutely quiet. Seventh day, they march around seven times. They blow the ram's horns, they shout, and the walls just go right down. Can you imagine that? That must have been quite a situation. How would that be, following directions like that, that battle plan? You know, God gives us a lot of directions in the scripture that don't appear to make sense. Why, if we did it that way, this would happen? Well, I don't believe that. I think I'm just going to do it my way. You know, the battle was the Lord's. We sang about that this morning. The directions were the Lord's. And we'll come to Rahab in just a minute. But think of some of the verses that... Uh, would be challenging to say, uh, if we do it that way, uh, you know, will we get those types of results? And I'm thinking of Proverbs 28.13, it says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses them and forsakes them will have mercy. You know, our tendency to confess sin is, you know, kind of minimal, right? Uh, we tend not to do that because we would be embarrassed and, you know, people would lose faith in us. Well, you know, the honesty may actually bump people's faith up and say, I can trust you because you were honest about this. I'm also thinking of Revelation 12, 
Uh, verses 17 to 19. Don't repay anyone for evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Have you ever heard the phrase, let's fight fire with fire? Yeah. You know what you wind up with? Burn places. Yeah. Boy, there's been how many instances where somebody's lit a backfire and it, it blew up on them and went the wrong direction and you've just burned more than you had before burned. You know, if we trust God and if we try to live at peace as far as it lies within us, you know, God will take care of the rest. And boy, he can do the revenge on people more effectively and, and without our getting involved than we can. I'm thinking also of Ephesians 4.32. We, we often learn this verse as children uh, in Sunday school. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other as God in Christ forgave you. It's tough to forgive. It's tough to be kind, isn't it? But what are the results? Uh, isn't it good to see what God can do when we're kind? I think also of, uh, of Proverbs 15.1. There's a lot of verses in Proverbs that don't seem to make sense. But Proverbs 15.1 says what? A soft answer turns away wrath. You know what? What's your experience when you argue with somebody? What happens to the volume? It just gets ratcheted up back and forth. What does is, what is Proverbs 15.1 say? A soft answer, a quiet answer turns away wrath. I had an amazing experience one time. My grandson was pitching a hissy fit, and you know he was just crying uncontrollably. And I did something I'd never done before. I whispered in his ear, "Please stop crying immediately. I need to talk to you." A whisper, and it shut the tears off and the and the commotion like that. I've never tried it since, but <laughs> I'd suggest that to you. Boy, it worked. <laughs> He was crying about something that actually didn't happen. He had the wrong information, so it was a real waste of his time and effort. <laughs> but just that quiet word settled somebody down. That was interesting. What else do we see? One who gives freely grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers one. Boy, doesn't it? This is not health and wealth and prosperity gospel. This is Bible. You know, there is a hard attitude about our giving. You know, we, we want to hoard, we want to keep, but God says, I'll multiply your seed for sowing, not for keeping, and you'll be a blessing. And then one of the relational verses I really enjoy is 1 Peter 3. Finally, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, uh, love one another, and, and uh, compassionate and humble. Don't repay evil or with evil or insult for insult. Well, we do that, don't we? We get the results we, we deserve because we, we disobey these verses. On the contrary, we pray evil with blessing. And because you've been called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So there are times when our faith needs to be operative when um, the directions sound odd. Those walls of Jericho came down, and there was a place in the city wall on the north side that it didn't fall. Guess who lived there? Rahab, which is the next verse in Hebrews chapter 11. My Bible opens right there. You know why? Because I've opened a lot of times to that chapter. What does it say in verse 31? Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Boy, this is an interesting story going back to Joshua again. Each time in the New Testament when Rahab is mentioned, she is mentioned as what? Rahab the harlot. But here is a woman who made a choice. And she made a choice that had a powerful impact on her family. It was a very important choice that salvation came to her and to her family um, in, in Jericho there. She lived by the city wall. She welcomed the spies that had come to check out the city and see what was going on. 
But I want you to notice, and I'm going to go back to Joshua chapter 2, because it says, uh, after, or before they lay down, she came up and talked to them. She put them on the roof to hide them, put stalks of flax over them, uh, as that was, the flax was drying, the flax was drying there on the roof, and it, it hid them from the people who came and asked about them. But in verse 9 says, I know that Yahweh, I'm using that name because remember where she lived were the Canaanite gods, and she's making a major distinction between the God of Israel, Yahweh, and the Canaanite gods, okay? She says, I know Yahweh has given you the land. Hmm, I wonder where she heard that. Uh, word had gotten out that this land was going to belong to Israel. The terror of you has fallen on us, and all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. We have heard how Yahweh dried up the waters of the Red Sea uh, before you came out of when you came out of Egypt. Before you, when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and we had no courage remained in us uh, in any man longer because of you. For Yahweh, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Wow. That is quite a confession, isn't it? She's making a choice to disassociate herself with the people around her in her city, in that area, and identify herself with the people of Israel, Yahweh. She has faith that's based on evidence. She knew about Yahweh's past work. She knew Yahweh as God in heaven and on earth, and she understood something about covenant loyal, loyalty, uh, lo covenant loyal kindness. Look at verse um, 11, I mean, pardon me, 12. Therefore, please swear to me by Yahweh that since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will deal kindly with me in my father's household. Give me a pledge of truth. Now, I was curious, as many times I am, and I went back and took a look at words, allegiance or kindness. You know what that word is? That's that word hesed, the loyal love word. It's the covenant word for God's faithfulness in the Old Testament. This is the word that David uses in the, in the Psalms, your mercy is everlasting. Hesed. Heart, H. It's almost like clearing your throat. This is a word you know. This is like the agape love in the New Testament. It is based on the initiative and the will of the person doing the loving. She understood something about that in the sense that she used that word to say, I have been loyal to you. Would you be loyal to me? I am looking for salvation, uh, not only for me, but also my father's household. And the men said, yes, um, we will, uh, and in fact, she said, would you spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that belong to them? There was quite a family that was going to be saved as a result of Rahab's uh, action. So her family and she were saved physically. She entered the covenant relationship with Yahweh, God of Israel, and she became part of the line of Jesus, Messiah. Isn't that the grace of God? Boy, if there was a person that would exhibit the grace of God in the Old Testament, it is Rahab. And she is mentioned just in a verse at, um, in uh, chapter 14, I mean, chapter 11 of Hebrews. But think about her influence. If she is saying, my family is going to get together, we are together in this. Look at the information that she had to make that decision. And look at the rest of Jericho that didn't make the decision. They had the same information, basically, didn't they? They knew that, and this was before social media. <laughs> Something got to her, and she says, Yahweh did the work at the Red Sea. Yahweh defeated those guys that you did battle with, and Yahweh is giving you the land. I'd rather be part of that than what I'm part of now. Again, that identification, the faith is based on evidence. <coughs> when Rahab, when Jericho fell, only Rahab and her family were spared. What must it have been like to see the entire city fall into rubble 
and then be burned. Would that have been like the Twin Towers coming down? I think so. There was no U-Haul parked by the wall. They left with the clothes on their back, and nothing was taken, because God said, don't take anything. Never from the city. That's all they had. Everything was destroyed. That's what Rahab left. She left the gods of the Canaanites. And God calls us to do exactly the same thing. We leave the past and the gods we were worshiping. The sacramental religion, the whatever you were trusting in. Maybe you were trusting in yourself because you were an atheist or agnostic. Maybe you were part of a religion that said you need to do this in order to be saved. You need to do this list of stuff in order to be saved. And God says, no, that's not the case. She was certainly in the minority. Faith sometimes results in miracles and sometimes in suffering. And this is the part of the chapter I don't know that I ever heard a sermon preached on. And I've heard quite a few sermons. This is the part that we skip because we like to talk about the miracles. And it says in, in the scripture here, um, in verse 32 and following, What more shall I say? Time fails me if I, don't, uh, if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, and who conquered uh, kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouth of lions. We've, we know those guys. Uh, you know, Daniel was the one that threw, threw in the lion's den. There were others that dealt with lions in their life, David and, and others. Quench the flames of the fire. We think of the three Hebrew uh, young men that were thrown by Nebuchadnezzar into the fiery furnace. I kind of like the, I think it's the Southern Gospel song, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, they, or they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. I was going to sing that for you, but I don't know the rest of the words. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Escaped death by the edge of the sword. There were people who uh, weren't executed. It says their weaknesses were turned to strength. They became strong in battle, put entire armies to flight. We saw that. Women received back their dead by resurrection. I'm thinking that writer is talking about Elijah and Elisha uh, raising young boys back to life in the Old Testament. I don't think there were other instances that I remember. But then we get to the next part of the verse. And what do we see? It says, but, or and, others were tortured, not accepting their release. They were mocked, they were flogged, they were put in chains in prison. Scourgings, imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn in two. It was uh, tradition that uh, Isaiah was uh, killed by being sawn in two by the king of Manasseh. Uh, they were ill-clothed. This was not a fashion statement. This was, that's what they had. They were poor. They were destitute. They were afflicted. They were ill-treated. They were wanderers in harsh places. That was what Christian life was like for many. But we like to go to the miracles. Oh, Lord, send us miracles. Do this, do this, do this. And God says, wait a minute. I want to show you the other heroes of the faith. In fact, I, if I had my brothers, I would not call this the, uh, the heroes of faith chapter. I would call it the what? The heroes of endurance chapter. These people slogged through the muck and mire of difficulty in life. They were pressed. And yes, God did miracles, but if you go back and look at the miracle, what proportion of miracle is there, or miracles is there compared to the rest of life? It's very small, isn't it? Now, I'm sure God may have done miracles in your lives. He's entered and done stuff and opened doors that you could probably say, that was a miracle. But my guess is that the bigger proportion is you've been slogging through the mud and the rough places. That's the bigger proportion of life, is it not? I think it is. We need to get real about the Christian life. We've kind of been sold the bill of goods that Jesus deals with all your problems and everything is cushy once we trust Jesus. Well, really, the Christian life is lived in the power of God 
uh, developing our spiritual character and muscle to glorify Him. Would you buy that? Yeah, I, I hope so. Because that's really the way it is. And we need to offer that to people and say, listen, there's a world after this one that goes on for eternity and these uh, 70, 80, 90 years or whatever we have, it could be much shorter than that. You know, we can, we can deal with this. We may be pressed beyond measure and we may not like it. It is not comfortable. It is, not, it is painful. But God says, I've got a plan. And that's what he talks about. To embrace God's promise, he says in Hebrews 10.35, let's hold unswaveringly to the hope that we profess for he who is promised is faithful. And Hebrews 11 is about the faith that obeys, endures, and looks forward to the promises of God that will come in eternity, not now. I want to connect you to what Daniel is going to be preaching out because it says, therefore, and I didn't put the therefore up there, but in chapter 12 it says, therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and that comes out of chapter 11. These witnesses are witnesses of the endurance and the faith that obeys, uh, that this is why it's connected to 10 and 12. This is the endurance chapter, and it's important. So the faith that pleases God makes decisions based on God's commands and principles. Doesn't depend on grat uh, results, gratification, and success. Doesn't depend on our own abilities and resources. But it does, and it may, bring us into conflict with government and other institutions in our world, and it will. It obeys when the directions are odd. It has a powerful impact on our family, and it may be either positively or negatively um, maybe our family gets saved as a result of our testimony, but maybe we are disowned by our family because of our testimony as well. It could go either way, but it is going to have a powerful impact. And sometimes our faith that endures and obeys is going to result in miracles, and sometimes it is going to result in suffering. It just finished reading a book, and I could barely put it down. It's called The Dime That Lasted Forever by Rochunga Pudaiti. That's not exactly a household name. Rather funny. This guy came from a line of headhunters in the northern tribes of India. I met him personally. He spoke at our church, at Grace Bible Church, back in Oconomo years ago in the late 80s. Very interesting guy. You want to read a book that kind of mirrors or some of the things in uh, chapter 11, uh, 10 bucks. No. <laughs> uh, listen, if 25 of you want to read this book, I'll get more copies. But this is a book that will curl your hair in the right direction. And if you don't have any, <laughs> that's not my problem. <laughs> Great book. But... You can imagine what it would be like to minister in India. But I, I, I highly recommend that book to you. Not because it uh, takes anything away from the Word of God, but it amplifies it into a modern person. And you can go up to our library and you will find books up there. I just love uh, reading and I've got a lot of time to read at this point in my life. But, um, you know, that, that's an amazing thing. Read those stories and say, God, uh, you're no different for them than you are for me. What are you doing in my life? You know, would you challenge me to live? So, by faith, you know, what is it? Keep moving in the right direction. Two words, moving, right? Amen. Right direction. <laughs> that's three words. <laughs> Sorry, I can't count. Anyway, let's do that. We need to be encouragers to each other. Because some of us, uh, many of us, all of us, are facing stuff, stuff of life. Maybe difficulties. And there's no real light at the end of that tunnel. Um, that's okay. What's God's purpose? It is to build your character in, this, in conformity to the image of Christ. That's the goal. That's the goal. We've got to keep that in mind. That's what we esteem. That's what we value. The other stuff we can we can slog through with the help of our fellow believers, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay.
Let's do it. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for just the joy of knowing your word and being encouraged this way that we can um, capitalize on who you are and your purpose. And may we be like the people that we just read about that have that faith that endures, that obeys, that sees uh, through the fog to the...